Hello, is this Mr. Greg Lake? Yes, it is. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Very well, thank you. I am proud to welcome Greg Lake to Sam's Musical Mystery Tour on Cove FM, the voice of St. Margaret's Bay, Nova Scotia. This man is the voice of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. He was also the original voice for another group called King Crimson, one year prior to ELP's formation. Greg, welcome to the show. Sam, it's nice to be here. Now, uh, one thing I have to say, you you guys are the best darn progressive rock band on this planet. Uh, on the topic of progressive rock in general, with its elaborate musical passages, uh, extended solos, bizarre time signatures, and having an overall system of thinking outside the box, was it referred to as prog rock right from the beginning in the late 60s during your King Crimson days, or was this a name that was sort of generated and later on sort of tacked on? Uh, it was it was something that was thought of later, really. Uh, and to be honest with you, I, I you know I don't really like the term prog rock or progressive rock. It, it sounds sort of pseudo intellectual, uh, and there's nothing really clever about progressive music. Uh, the, the the real the difference between what people call progressive rock and most forms of rock and roll is that most rock and roll looks towards, for its roots, looks towards American music, blues, Motown, soul, gospel, country and western. That's the roots of most rock and roll music. Yeah. But progressive music really drew from European roots, classical music, folk music, medieval music. And so it really is a question of you know, where the initial inspiration came from. And that's the only difference, really. I mean, progressive music doesn't have those standard formats, you know, verse, verse, chorus, verse, because it's based on music which didn't have those type of constrictions. You know, it was based on classical music, so you could have a song that was 17 minutes long or, you know, uh, anything really it was a more varied form and so but you could really argue that that um a, a record like sergeant pepper really was one of the early progressive music records uh because it, it was certainly based on european rather than american music right yeah yeah it, it, i i think that sergeant pepper was probably the album that kind of uh begun that sort of uh, direction, I guess. In, in it was certainly an early, you know, an, an, an early influence in terms of moving away from drawing upon purely American, uh, American roots. So I've read that you have an autobiography coming out um, that you've been uh, working on called um, Lucky Man. Yes. Very, very suitable title, I'd say. Well, yeah, and, uh, you know, and in many ways it... I mean, I thought, of, you know, I thought long and hard about a title, but I don't think there can be, a, for me personally, a more appropriate title because it, that's really what I was. I mean, I was born in a, 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 I was a very poor family. We were born in an asbestos prefab, and, you know, grew up really with very little. And, you know, it was unimaginable, really, when I was young, to think that I would I would uh, have the life that I've had, you know, or the opportunities that I've had. And so I do consider myself as being very, very lucky. And, um, of course, the song, you know. And so it kind of fits in, really. And um, uh, I just, uh, I've been writing it for some years now. And I, I keep meaning to bring it out. But every time I get close to it, somebody comes up and says, you know, Greg, do you remember that time about, you know, the story about this and that? If you included that in the book, and I think, oh, God, no, I've forgotten it, you know. And I go in and I put it in then, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I keep going back to it and adding things. And I suppose there's this fear of, um, of, of, you know, just not wanting to leave something out, which was important. Uh, And so... um, and so I've, I've continued, but of course, sooner or later, I've got to stop, and that's it, really, because I think you could you could actually write a book about one day in your life if you really wanted to. Yeah. And, you know, there's got to be a place where you say, well, 
that's it, really. I mean, that's that's one take on a lifetime, and um, I think I'm very near that point now, and I, I shall start and get, and get it published, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it would be very difficult. I mean, it's the story of your life, you know, um, like all, all together, you know. There's, um, the, there's so many stories and there's so many perspectives, you know, uh, and and it is truly impossible. I mean, certainly during the 1970s, throughout the 1970s, every single day in the career of VLP was extraordinary. Almost every single day. I can imagine. <laughs> and, and, you know, you could almost write a chapter on every single day. The California Jam, the Olympic Stadium, Montreal, the Isle of Wight Festival. These things were biblical in their proportions. You're talking 600,000 people at some of these events. And, you, you know, the experience was extraordinary. And so, um, you, you know... I could go rambling on about any one of them for a long time. But, but of course, you know, what I've tried to do really is give, is, is give a perspective on it as if it were from behind the scenes. Because people obviously saw what was in front. You know, they saw the shows, they bought the records. What they didn't see really was what was going on behind the scenes. Right on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always cool to, to see that kind of uh, perspective for sure. You've released a live recording earlier this year, uh, back in February, I believe, called uh, Songs of a Lifetime. Um, yes. Highlighting music from pivotal uh, points in your career, as well as telling stories, yes. your experiences with these great bands, and as a solo artist as well. Let's travel back in time now. Uh, do you remember your very first gig? If so, could you tell me about what that was like? When you say my very first gig, what do you mean, really, my very first gig as a young boy? Or do you mean my first show as a ELP or King Crimson? Um, I guess, well, in, in any um, sort of band. Um. My first recollection of ever playing in front of an audience was as a young boy. I must have been maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I'd formed this little band with my friend. And we played at this bingo hall. I don't know if you have bingo where you are. Yes, we you know, do, yeah. Yeah, they call out numbers and it's like that. And in the interval, we got up and played. And we, we played our little songs that we knew, you know. And the audience clapped dutifully. And at the end of it, they passed around this hat. And they all put a little bit of money in. And that was my first experience, really, of, you know, playing music being appreciated and earning money. Yeah. You know, it was a it was the total thing in one miniaturized little moment, you know. But it was enough to 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 switch on the light of 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 thinking, wow, well, you know, that's a great thing to play money, people appreciate to, to play music, you know, get money and people appreciate it as well. You know, that was a fantastic thing. And uh, so even at a very, very young age, I was kind of aware of that that where, that, that phenomenon of, of being able to play as a professional musician, even though I wasn't professional, but the components were there, you know. Um, and, it, and it went from there, really. I mean, for many years then, probably for eight or nine years, I was in various little local bands and, and traveling around the United Kingdom, sleeping in the back of a van, uh, living a, a very rough life, actually. Um, and it was only when I came to form King Crimson that we really achieved any major sort of international success. Right. Uh, and it, it literally changed overnight, you know, from being somebody you'd no one ever heard of to being someone everybody had heard of happened in about 24 hours, you know, or it seemed like that anyway. It happened very fast. And, um, and so that was quite a remarkable uh, experience. Yeah, that'd be quite the mind blast for sure. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Um, okay, what was I going to... Yeah. Now I've got you lost, right? <laughs> no, 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 actually, no, no, um... I, I was, <laughs> Sorry if I took you away from the, 
<laughs> no, no, it's quite that's quite all right. Actually, you, you didn't uh, derail anything. Um, okay. Uh, what, what was what did you call yourselves like when when? Uh... I don't think we had a name originally. The little band we put together, we didn't have a name. We we just went out and did it, you know. Ah. And um, we just did it did it for fun. We were little kids learning how to play, and so we just did it, you know. And um, and then there was, I mean, I don't know, there was five or six bands in a row, you know, young bands, kids bands, you know, going up. And later on, uh, I began to, to get more serious about it and started some of the bands that actually started to make records. Uh, one of the bands I was in was called The Shame, and we started to, to actually make records. And um, that was a more sort of, uh, sort of semi-professional type of situation. Right. Yeah, actually, that that was going to be the next question <laughs> was about the the shame because I, I I looked I looked them up on um, a, a helpful little music website called uh, Rate Your Music and um, it looks like there was only one single um, ever released unless there's others. That I believe I, that's right. Yeah, it was a song by uh, uh, written by a lady called Janice Ian. All right. Yes. Uh, it was called Don't Go Away, Little Girl, <laughs> and it was it was uh, strange, but but. The manager, my manager at the time, the manager of The Shame, came up with it and said, look, you know, uh, I've got this great song. You should record it. And uh, so we said, okay, and we recorded it. And uh, and that was it, really. And, and um, that was my first experience as a recording artist. And that really was interesting because it it was the other perspective. You know, up until that time, my experiences of musician had purely been performing live in front of an audience yeah now it became going into a recording studio and making a recording and that was a different dimension of uh performance you know it was a whole different uh thought process it was a different skill so that was that was something and, and it was something i really in me immediately enjoyed doing. I immediately took to it. Uh, like a duck to water. Most musicians do. Um, it, you know, there, there, is a, there is an immense pleasure in making a record and sitting there and hearing it back. And, you know, I suppose being proud of what you've done, you, you know, if you're lucky enough to have got it right. And... Um, uh, you, you know, and then, and then subsequently, other people hearing it uh, and enjoying it, and so it's a way in which your music can be enjoyed without you physically being there, really. Yeah. And that 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 still is a very magical, a magical thing for me. I mean, I I don't think I ever really got over the fact that music passes through the air unseen, and it goes from soul to soul. And it actually has the power to move someone's emotions from a distance. It's a very powerful thing if you think about it. It is. Yeah. And, and and it's a very strange thing. And it's a very primal thing. I suppose it goes right back to jungle drums and things like that where messages of various kinds could be celebration, could be a warning. It could be a lot of things. But but a message would be sent with sound and vibration. And it became more and more sophisticated over the years when different types of emotions could be transmitted with different types of, of musical um, construction. And so it became a more and more fascinating way of sending these messages. And I think that still is what fundamentally... Uh, interest me about music. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's amazing how like sa- sound patterns can you know c- affect emotions and all that stuff, right? It, That's right. It's amazing, uh, and and you know the the very best of them can are designed to do just that. Yeah, and and to and to take you on a journey, an emotional journey. And I mean, in a way, you mentioned songs of a lifetime. That really is what I intended to do with that record. 
and, I, and I actually, as it happens, I'm very pleased with it. Uh, you, you know, I look back on it now, and I really am proud of that record. It is something that it, it turned out to be exactly what I wanted it to be. That's that's always a nice feeling <laughs> to to know when you've. It is. It when, is when you, because when you receive that. always do you get that? You know. Another group you were with uh, prior to King Crimson was a group called the Gods. Yes. I noticed that in this group, um, there is Mick Taylor, who would later join the Rolling Stones, and another member, Ken Hensley, who would right. later become the keyboard player and one of the singers uh, with Your Eye Heap. Yeah. Um, could you tell me about your experience with the Gods? Uh, it was very brief. Uh, I, you know, I was really only with them for a it must have been a matter of a couple of months, really. Uh, you know, it was, again, the, the same manager that, that was involved with the Shane uh, gave me a call one day because he knew I, basically, I lived, I grew up in, in a town called Pool in Dorset, which is on the south coast of England. And it's really a sort of rural farming place, or it was then. And, of course, most of the music was happening in London, the capital city. And I wanted to move up to London, but, you know, without any means of support, it wasn't possible. Right. And one day I got a call from this manager who said, Greg, you know what? If you want to move up to London, I manage this band called The Gods, and they need, you know, a lead singer. Would you be interested? And I said, you know, it doesn't matter anything to move up to London, you know. Yeah. And so I came up there, and... Uh, I joined them for a while, but they really were, the Gods were one of those bands that sort of everyone joined. It was like a musical roundabout. You jumped on and you jumped off, you know. Oh. Uh, I, I think that's exactly what happened to Mick Taylor. He, he was in it for a while, and then he was out, you know. They never really had any musical foundation. I don't, I don't think they actually ever made any records, to be honest with you. Um, they may have done, but as, uh, I soon I certainly didn't make any with them and um uh, so it really it was just uh, uh, to be honest it was just a, something of convenience uh, to get me up to london and it was only shortly after that that i got off a phone call from robert fripp my um my old musical chum from back in pool in dorset we we had gone to the same guitar teacher a man called don strike and, and Robert and I used to practice our lessons together. Nice. Uh, and Don Strike also taught Andy Summers. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Uh, and we were all from the South Coast and uh, of, of of England. And, uh, you know, Robert and I basically had grown up together as musicians. And so we really understood each other very well. And uh, and that was it. And, and uh and, uh, you know, we, we we decided to form this band, King Crimson. And so we did. Nice. The third band I've noticed you had been with prior to uh, King Crimson, uh, before we get to them, uh, was an outfit, or, well, a group called the Shy Limbs. W what was it like being a Shy Limb, if only briefly? <laughs> uh, again, it was a very brief. These were sort of bands that I was part of for, uh, you know, brief period, and there's not really much to tell. They were bands that mainly played music from the ch charts, and occasionally had a stab at writing things themselves. You know, right. we used to write the odd song here and there, and it was like most sort of young bands, I suppose. You know, they learn by playing other people's music, and then uh, you know, graduate into doing your own stuff. And that was, it, the, the word I suppose is transitional. Mm. It was transitional between the early sort of guitar lessons and kids play bands and professional bands. It was this transition of semi-professional, you know, where you still had a day job and you used to play in the evenings and all that kind of thing. So, you know, there was nothing really to tell about about it. It was just a transitional movement from being an amateur to a professional. Right. I suppose it is important in that in that light, but there's nothing much to tell about it. It just was 
a sort of grinding process where you improve your skills and your ability and uh, and you work you know you hone your skills to become better and better player and eventually a better writer uh, right on so definitely a, if anything definitely a stepping stone for sure that's right that's uh, exactly what it was one thing i'd like to do when having a rare chance to interview a famous musician such as yourself is to take a chronological look through a select portion of an artist's discography. Um, I'd like to start with, the, um, most obviously, I guess, with the debut album by King Crimson and the Court of the Crimson King. Tell me, uh, if you would, the story behind the album cover. The face uh, on the cover, that's the 21st century schizoid man, isn't it? Um, well, I like to think it is. Nobody ever officially said that's what it was. What happened was that... Um, and I actually tell this story uh, on the show, Songs of a Lifetime. Um, at the end of the recording sessions for the record in the Court of the Crimson King, when we came to the end of the uh, sessions, and we'd almost finished the album, the last track we did was Schizoid Man. And just as we were recording it, we realized that... Um, we didn't have an album cover. And none of us knew the first thing about uh, 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 graphical art. So we were, you know, we were panicking. What are we going to do for an album cover? And Pete Sinfield uh, came up. He said, I've got a friend who's, who's a graphic artist in an advertising company. Maybe I could ask him, you know, if he would, if he would do something. And so we said that that sounds good. Give him a give him a call and, and see if he would be able to help us. So Pete gave, gave this guy a call. His name was Barry Gobber. And um, a couple of days later, we were pretty much finishing off Schizoid Man, and the bell rang at the studio. Somebody was at the door, and so we stopped playing. And they opened the door, and in came this young man, and he had this parcel under his arm, wrapped in brown paper, and tied up with string. And he stood at the doorway, and of course none of us knew who he was, but Pete recognized him. He was Pete's friend. So Pete said, oh, Barry, come in, you know, come and meet the band. And so he came, walked across the studio floor, and we shook hands with him and said hello and everything. And um, he took a pair of scissors out of his pocket, and he cut the string and he tore off the paper and he dropped this picture, this painting, on the, gr on the floor. Just dropped it on the floor right. at our feet. And we all stared down. And there we were looking at the cover, which is now the, the cover, this famous cover now, this iconic cover of Court of the Crimson King. And we realized, all of us simultaneously, that what he was, was the face of Schizoid Man. <laughs> this screaming, panicking. Uh, it was reflected in the lyrics, and yet there was no way he could have known. You know? Uh, yeah. It was a bizarre... I mean, I call it a coincidence. I don't know if that is the right word. It's certainly some sort of strange happening. We were all, you know, I mean, the image... Uh, if you very for anyone who knows the album cover, the image is extremely striking. Yes. And um, you know when you when you've just recorded a song called Schizoid Man, and you look at that face, it is arresting. The coincidence is quite unnerving. Anyway, there was no discussion about is it the right cover or not. It was obviously the best album cover anyone had ever seen. Yeah. And so that was that. And um, we congratulated him, and, and it was like that. And he went away, and we we said, yeah, get, you know, get it knocked up. We'll do, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, a few days after that, we got a phone call, and this young man who'd done the album cover, he was only 21 years old at the time, he dropped dead uh, on the pavement. Really? Walking down the pavement, walking down the street, fell down, dead. Oh Literally fell, fell over and died of a heart attack. 
And, of course, we were completely, completely spun. No kidding. He, you know, a few days before, there was this young, vibrant young man, happy, happy as Larry, you know, done this fantastic album cover. And then three days later, he was dead. And we really didn't know what to do. We, you know, we, we thought, you know, should we not use the cover? You know, would it be disrespectful? In the end, we decided that, that the best thing we could do would be to, to you know, to use it as a tribute to him. Yeah. And, I, and I'm so glad we did that because it really is, um, you know, it's a tribute to his life, really. And it, as I said, it's one of the most iconic album covers of all time, really. Um, and so that was the the basic story of how that album cover came about. Uh, it, in the end, it embodied the whole of the album, which was a very strange record. It was, I suppose, the, you know, I suppose the term would be visionary in a way. And it sounds pretentious to say it, but when you hear Kanye West doing the song Power, I've heard of about. I heard about that. Yeah, I I never heard his um, his uh, not cover, but adaptation, if you will. Um, well, he just sampled. He sampled my voice singing the singing the the hook. Right. Twenty first century schizoid man, and the fact is that it sounds contemporary. I think the whole of the record in the Court of the Crimson King could have been made today. You know. It, it, it would sound, it would not sound out of place if it had been made today, and it was almost fifty years ago. Yeah, it was very very ahead of its time. Um, the, I, I, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's ahead of, in that in that sense. I suppose you're right, but it, it we didn't and we certainly didn't make it with a view to try to be smart ass and you know make it ahead of its time in that sense. It just was something that was timeless. It was timeless in a way. I think we made it not to be a pop record, not to be a sort of a rock rock album contender commercially. We tried to make it as a work of art. Yeah. And in that sense, I think it has stood up to the test of time. I think so too. Well, I'm, I'm, I speak for many people. So the next album I want to take a look at is uh, In the Wake of Poseidon. Now, this record is sort of a similar contrast to the debut uh, musically, but is indeed a nice follow-up to the, the predecessor. Now, you intended to leave the band after the debut album, but one of the members, Fripp, I believe, requested for you to stay for this record? What happened was, um, the original band, we did a tour of the United States, and Ian, you know, at the end of it, uh, Ian and Mike... Ian McDonald, who wrote a lot of the material, he played the mellotron and the flute, saxophone. And Mike Giles, the drummer, they decided that they really didn't like touring. They didn't like flying very much, and they just didn't like life on the road, I think. And they decided they would like to um, actually devote their time to, to, uh, to um, you know, making records in the studio. Robert wanted to carry on with the band uh, under the name of King Crimson. I just didn't feel good about it. Uh, you know, Ian and Mike were such a large part of the chemistry, but I felt it was there was it was a dis it was in a way it was dishonest. I just mm. didn't feel comfortable just replacing them as though well it didn't matter. You know that the let's just get two guys new guys in and pretend it didn't. I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, so I said to Robert, look, I, you know, if you want to form a new band, I'm happy to do that. But I, I don't want to carry on as King Crimson. And Robert really, I think he saw a value in the name and in the goodwill that we'd built up. And he wanted to carry it on. So that was it, really. And what happened is, <laughs> strangely enough, on the actual, on the same night that Ian and Mike left, we were playing at... at um, a venue in San Francisco called the Fillmore West. Right. And on the same bill was this band, The Nice. Ah, uh, ha, 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 okay. And it had Keith Emerson in it. And it just so happened we were staying at the same hotel. And after the show, we got back, we went back to the hotel. And as artists do, we congregated in the bar. 
And Keith said to me, hey, you know, how, how's it going? And I said, well, to be honest, Keith, it's not going very well. We liked, you know, I've, the band's just broken up, really. And he said, that's interesting, because he said, I've, you know, I've done as much as I can with the knife. So I think that um, there's not much more I can really do. And uh, so he, he said, I wonder if it's worth considering putting a band together. And that's where, that's when ELP actually started, on the same night. That Ian and Mike left. It was just very coincidental, and um, and, and that was it really. And uh, so one finished and the uh, the, the other started. Now Robert went on and started to make another record, but you know he he kind of went into it too quickly and hadn't got a singer really, and so he start he started making the album, but but hadn't really settled on a singer. So he said to me, "Look, would you would you mind, you know, doing the vocals until I get somebody to um, to replace you?" And so I said, "No, you know, I I, I didn't really just do this favour. Came in and I sang a few of the songs, a few of the tracks on there. And um, so I, you know, I was kind of in two bands at the same time at that moment in time. Um, but Robert and I were friends, and you know, I I had no." problem with him continuing on with, with the band uh, you know so I was happy to sort of help out this is really interesting stuff <laughs> I, I didn't um, this is actually I mean this is something I, I, I never had known previously I mean obviously <laughs> I hadn't known previously otherwise I wouldn't have asked um, but from like yeah. reading from reading about the album th- that that particular aspect about um, when, when you met uh Emerson through the nice and all the matter stuff I didn't uh, didn't know as well before. Because no. when you mentioned the nice, I was like, ah, that's where it sort of began. Okay. The next album of, is, of course, the grand debut, the self-titled debut record by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Now, first off, let's talk about the album art for this particular record. There appears to be uh, what looks like a white owl or some other bird in flight. Is there a lyrical connection there between the artwork and the words for this record? No. Almost all ELP albums were retrofitted with concepts and album covers. You know, in other words, we made the record first and then thought of the title afterwards. It was just the way we, it was just the way it was done. Okay. And... I look back on that. I, I, I you know, I, I think I was okay. So I think, in, in a way, I think it, it is healthy to, to, to put the music first, really, uh, and let let the whole thing be music led. Um, and so that was the way that the records were made, um, and the album covers were, you know, once the album was finished, the question was finding, a, you know, a, a suitable album cover. Uh, and that was that was the case with all of the LP albums, really. Who did the uh, who who did the artwork for it? Was it? Uh... Oh, I can't I can't give you all the names and the you know. I mean, I make the music. I don't really do the album covers. Uh, I can't I just can't remember his name off the top of my head. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm sure if you look on the album, he'll be credited. Right. Okay. So on this album, of course, you know. You see, uh, "Lucky Man" is the last track, and um, I've read that that was sort of um, added on, not exactly at the last minute, was it? Like it, I, it was really a last minute thought. I mean, we'd we'd come to the end of the record, and we were actually one track short. Uh, in those days, you know, that was vinyl, vinyl records, and and you had to have. Uh, it was kind of. Uh, I believe it was something like 19 minutes aside or something like that, some strange timing. Yeah. We got to the end of the album and we were, you know, on, on, on side two, we were, we were at 17 minutes. And so we were short of a song. And because we'd made that first album in such a hurry, uh, under pressure, a lot of it, you know, when we formed the band that, you know, instantly people were saying, well, where's your, you know, where's the, where's the album? Uh, so, you know, we had to make an album very quickly. And uh, so we came to the end of uh, the recording sessions and we were one song short. And 
nobody had any material. So it was just a question of looking around the studio and saying, you know, who's, has anybody got any ideas? And I said, well, look, you know, if there's, if there's no ideas, uh, you know, I've, I wrote this folk song when I was a kid. If you're just looking for something to fill, you know, as an album filler, maybe that would do. And so he said, well, look, you know, play, play this song. Let's have a listen. And I played it and no one liked it. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't really care, but, you know, that's all we've got. So everyone agreed that we should, I should record it. Uh, basically, Keith said, well, why don't you just record it on your own? And that's what I did. I, I, I pretty much, Lucky Man is pretty much all me. Yeah. Except for the end, which is Keith playing the, the. What happened was Keith went down the pub, and I recorded the track all on my own. I put on all the guitars, the bass, the harmonies, the electric guitars, so everything. Um, Carl, of course, put on the drums, and um, uh, uh, Keith came back in the studio a couple of hours later, and the record was finished. And he was shocked. You know, it, it changed from this sort of plaintive little strumming folk song to this quite powerful and you know quite commercial sounding record um so he said well you know i'd, I'd better play on it you know so uh, we i said i said yeah but you know absolutely but the only thing is I've, I've already done the guitar solo it's not really a you know there's no, there's no room on to, to put a guitar you know on the guitar solo he said oh, i'll just put something on the end and that's what happened. He, he um, went out, experimented, and that's how that Moog solo ended up on it. Right. Uh, which was another sort of um, strange, you know, one-off, definitive, groundbreaking thing. You know, that, that synthesizer solo is probably the best-known synth solo in the world. Most, Yeah, most likely. It's interesting, like, that, that was a song you wrote uh, when you were, what, 12 years old, was it? I was 12 when I wrote Lucky 12 Man, year, yeah. 12 years old. And, it's and when it... I just, I just, my mother had just bought me a guitar. And I learned, uh, the first chords I learned, D, G, A minor, E minor. And with those four chords, I wrote this little kid's song. It was a child, sort of child's medieval fantasy, really. Right. And uh, for some reason, I remembered it. I never wrote it down, uh, it just stuck in my mind, and um, I don't know why. It's one of those, I suppose, the first thing you write, you it's some somehow special, and uh, and I remembered it, and and it and it just came in handy at that moment. Uh, but no one, even you know, even when we recorded it, no one dreamt that it would have you know uh, taken on the significance that it did. Ultimately, yeah, it's um. It's amazing how, how, like you know, it, it blossomed into like a a grand, a grand little uh, almost folksy kind of number there. And now the next record, my all-time favorite, Brain Salad Surgery. Mm. You've worked with um, Pete Sinfield uh, again um, for the grand, uh, I guess, sort of semi-sci-fi themed epic Carnival Nine. I love the science fiction feel of this number. Now, how did the composition and lyrics for uh, Carnival Nine? develop you know pete and i wrote pretty much together all, all the way through from king crimson you know on and off all, all through elp's entire career so we, we've written together you know pretty much all time and um what happened really was we we just made the record trilogy and we were unable to perform a lot of trilogy because it had so many overtubs on it we were unable to create the same overdubs live. So what we decided to do, that on the next record, we decided to make the record live first so that we could perform it. Right. And then turn around and record it afterwards. That's exactly what we did. We, we actually, it sounds terribly extravagant, but what we did is we bought a cinema and we took all the chairs out and we, we set up on the stage and we started to make the album on the stage. And I suppose part of the concept was this sort of, this image of this carnival. And 
This is where the line, welcome back my friends, to the show that never ends, came from. It was this sort of bizarre carnival, this parade of images going past you, you know. And it was also connected with our awareness of how computers were starting to dominate. I mean, it sounds painfully obvious now. Yeah. <laughs> but then um, you have to bear in mind that they hadn't even invented the fax machine at that time. No. Let alone, there was no thing. There was no mobile phone. There was no laptop. There was no computer as you know it. But there were the very early the very early days of computer and we could already see how you know how it would grow eventually where people would become more more and more increasingly dependent upon the computer and and the line there is load your program i am yourself and the um and so it was a blend of this this bizarre carnival and this sort of circus tent atmosphere, this live show, and what the live show was the future, really. I suppose that would be the best way of telling the, the tale. The, the live show was really a kind of look into the future of where computers would dominate people. Right. Uh, and that was, that was the essence of the record. Right on. Well, it kind of when I listen to this song, it makes me think. Well, I guess the computer's kind of won. <laughs> and, well, uh, yeah. I mean, it is interesting again that I mean, now you look. We could talk about this all night, but I mean, now you uh, you know, computer, the internet has basically swallowed the music business. Yes. You know? that is true. Um, not only the music business, it's it's starting to swallow shops now. You know, whereas you used to have a high street with shops or even a shopping mall with shops. Now, you won't even have that anymore because people will simply buy online and buy more and more online and do more things online. Uh, and And it will change the way we live dramatically. It, and it, I mean, in some ways it's good and perhaps in others not. But, it, you know, I definitely, uh, Pete and I could definitely foresee this gun, This was going to happen. You know, you didn't need to be Einstein to figure it out. It, you know, already people were using computers to, to substitute for, you know, uh, uh, accountants. You know, all of a sudden you could do away with bookkeepers because the, the computer would do it for you. And so forth and so on. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And it actually, it made me think like it, it's probably harder for a, a musician to, to to start out because it, since everything's kind of being uh, mostly generated uh, through um, an online, you know, media. I'm just trying to think of because uh, I, I know you. I know you said um, that you don't have a whole lot of time. No, no, I do, but, you know, I don't want to be on for hours. I, I'm happy to... Basically, I like to do interviews of sort of half an hour because after a while, just my, my ear gets hot. <laughs> I get fed up with talking. You uh, know? So, it's, but, you know, look, I'm, I, you know, I'm happy... On, on the subject, your questions are very interesting, but I can't go through... It would take me hours and hours and hours to talk to you about every album, and I, and I can't do that, obviously. Oh, uh, okay. That, that, that's, that's no problem. Actually, I, the initial intention, I think, was... I, I, was I mean, look, we could set up another time to talk as well. You know, I just don't like doing it all in one go, you know. But if, if you want to set up another interview, we can do that, and we can talk about some more of the albums. And, that, that's... Uh, you know, I'm happy to do that. It's just in one time, it just... It, you know, it just it gets to be a lot. But um, if you've got another question you'd like to ask to finish it off, I'm more than happy to 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 talk a little more. How does three more questions sound? Is that no, one more question sounds good. Oh, oh, one more. Okay, sorry. <laughs> How do you work out three more questions when you don't know the next question? Yeah. <laughs> good point. Right. Okay. Why um, don't you have a think and set another uh, set another time up with Billy, and we can talk again.
That sounds good. Um, one, one, okay, okay. Uh, one more thing. Not really a question. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, I'm gonna make this kind of statement short, and it's kind of weird to, for an interviewer to plug his own music, and it's kind of I don't know, if it's a little bit strange, but I have to do it because um, if it wasn't for me having discovered your music with Emerson Lincoln Palmer, I would not have released an album on iTunes. <laughs> I, I released an album called Obsessions on iTunes, and uh, yeah. Thought I'd mention that. <laughs> so sure. Sam Meisner obsession. It's still it's the same for all musicians. You know, I wouldn't be playing um, music myself had it not been for other musicians that that inspired me. I mean, that's the great thing about music is that um, it gets handed on, you know, from musician to musician, like an Olympic torch. Uh, yeah. uh, and I think that's a lovely that's a lovely thing about music, and um, it's nothing to be shy about. It's it's uh, 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 it's just a, an age old tradition that's been handed down since the jungle, you know. Yeah. Where we where we've learned learned from each other, and I suppose what happens is every musician has a puts their own stamp on it in a way, uh, uh, you know, makes it their own and, and contributes a bit. Uh, some more than others, you know, and sometimes it's a question of, you know, being in the right place at the right time and so exactly. forth and so on. But but that is the, the nature of the way that music gets made. Yeah. I understand that. I understand that. I have a request. It's sort of twofold. You don't have to do this, by the way. No, uh, I don't. Uh, one request was, uh, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind uh, doing kind of like, uh, I guess, a plug for the station. <laughs> no. I, I'll tell you what, you know, I, I, I will insist on if you want to do that, tell Billy beforehand and, you know, he'll send it in an email and I do I don't do them on the fly. Right. Oh, okay. Um, another, again, again, if you set another interview up, you tell Billy what you want ahead of the, the time. Uh, I'm happy to do it, but I just don't like doing them on the fly. Right. I understand. Okay. Um, well, look, it's been lovely to talk to you and, um, you know, you've asked a lot of interesting questions, and it's been fun. It has. So, you know, as I say, if you want to set up another interview, have a chat to Billy, and maybe in a, a month's time or something, we can have another chat, and you can ask some more questions, and I'll do a station ID or whatever you need to do then. That sounds good. Um, one, one last thing I just wanted to say, and I'm going to make this short. Um, yeah. The request was kind of a cheesy one, um, but... For next time, I was wondering if if you wouldn't mind if we both sang a a verse from Lucky Man. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't do that either. Yeah. But it's very nice to talk to you. See you, man. God bless. All the best. Bye. All right. Thank you very much, Greg.